Well, uh, I would like to welcome all of you uh, who participate in this webinar with uh, Aristotelis Papanikolaou Telis, uh, I think that you go by Telis. Um, yeah, either way, Aristotelis. Either way. All right, let's do the formal one, Aristotle Papanikolaou. Um, I have, it's the first time that we meet, I mean, it's, it's, it's not in person, but so to say face to face through Zoom, right. but uh, I'm quite familiar with his work uh, and his books. Uh, and um, um, I consider Aristotelian as one of the most prominent uh, Orthodox theologians who, uh, interestingly enough, uh, writes and teaches in the West. So I think that is what makes him very interesting to us because uh, obviously he tries to communicate uh, the Orthodox faith in a context which uh, interacts with you know, other faiths and other approaches. Uh, and it's, a, it's really a privilege to have him here with us today to lead this uh, seminar in a very uh, interesting topic for us, uh, uh, those of us who, you know, uh, participants who are evangelicals and Protestants about theosis. This is uh, one of uh, a topic which at the same time fascinates and also perplexes uh, Protestants. So we're really right. eager to see yeah. what does it look like. So right. the time is yours, I started. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's really an honor. And uh, I, I look forward to the questions and, um, and the discussion afterwards. I'm not going to speak very long. I would like to just bring everybody's attention to uh, the Orthodox Christian Studies Center here at Fordham University. You maybe see a little bit of a brochure back here. Um, I do uh, encourage you to uh, Perhaps um, you know, look at our website, see some of the content. Uh, we also have a forum called uh, Public Orthodoxy, um, which uh, may be of interest to you, um, where we discuss various kinds of issues as well. So I guess I just I really wanted to, um, uh, you know, as we say in the United States, put a plug in or put a you know kind of promote this center to you so that you're aware of it and perhaps tell other people that you know. I want to talk about theosis. Um, uh, it's interesting that Yoti said that it's a, a concept that um, is uh, perhaps um, uh, difficult for at least some Protestants. Uh, maybe some of you know this already, but I want to begin by at least indicating that um, through the Lutheran Orthodox dialogue, actually, there has been a great deal of uh, interest in theosis and research and even affirmation of theosis in Luther's writings uh, in the Scandinavian countries, in Norway, in Sweden, and in Finland, and especially in Finland. And that has uh, spilled over as well, I think, into some uh, English-speaking, uh, English-language uh, Lutheran theological writings uh, and beyond as well. So this is at least something to indicate in the beginning. Um, but I want to then now go back in time I do think um, theosis has been misunderstood, uh, not simply by uh, non-Orthodox Christians, but even by Orthodox themselves, quite honestly. Um, let me begin with perhaps a misrepresentation by someone like uh, Adolf Harnack, who um, you know, basically argued that uh, deification was the result of a kind of Greek philosophical influence on Christianity, which uh, distorted the true nature of the gospel. Um, I think this is a disputable point um, and not uh, given the brilliance of Harnack and not, not very carefully worked out thesis, I think to some extent. Um, of course, um, we have uh, in the New Testament uh, in First Peter, where uh, there it is spoken that um, we are partakers of the divine nature. So there's already reference there of some kind of union or communion with the living God. But uh, in the end, I think the thing I want to really talk about uh, is two things. One is the first is the sort of what is really the basis 
of um, this uh, affirmation of theosis or deification or becoming godlike? And what does it look like? Um, so the affirmation of it, the grounding of it, uh, really is the Christian affirmation and belief in and revelation of the incarnation, the incarnation. So it's not simply a particular biblical passage or a particular saying of Jesus. It's really uh, a, um, it really is, um, again, sort of the revelation, affirmation of the incarnation that in fact the Logos uh, became human, united God's self with human nature, with humanity. And this really gives us a different way of seeing creation, creation and humanity and uh, the reason why, uh, the reason for uh, which God had created the world and humanity. It indicates right away that humanity itself and creation, the created world matter, is not um, uh, in diametrical opposition to the divine. It's not um, in competition with the divine. Uh, it's not a dualist principle uh, that is somehow over and against the divine, but was created to bear the weight of the divine. And that weight, as St. Augustine so eloquently said, is love, which of course is a kind of weight that lifts us up towards God. So there's a transformation element to it. Uh, there's a sense in which the divine uh, in union with creation, with created world, with created matter, with humanity, uh, transforms it without negating its distinctiveness, uh, without negating its uniqueness or irreducibility. Um, and we see in, in the early centuries that there was a great deal of discussion and debate about who Jesus was. Um, some said he was just uh, a man, just a great human being. And as my uh, professor, David Tracy, once said to me, you know, uh, for Christians, Jesus is not just a very, 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 very good guy. He is the Messiah. And there was a great deal of discussion and debate in the first centuries about what it means to be the Messiah. And um, again, uh, for some, you know, to be just a prophet or to be a good person or to be a good human being was um, enough uh, in terms of understanding Jesus as the Messiah, the bringer of salvation. For others, um, uh, and I'm sure this history is well known to you, uh, Jesus was, um, you know, a kind of... Um, human, uh, a divine being in kind of a human covering or a human mask of some sort. No, but not real union, right? Not real union. Um, I think in, in all these discussions and debates uh, over the centuries, um, the real point of climax was uh, in the fourth century with Athanasius. Because Athanasius said that God became human so that humans can become divine. And in his debates with uh, not simply Arius, but other uh, Arian like uh, positions, Athanasius' point really was that if, this, if we all agree that this person is the Messiah, the bearer of salvation, then there can be no salvation without full union with the divine or union with the full divinity, not just half, not just part, not just, the, just someone in between, but full divinity. And of course, there were those who were uh, nervous that that compromised the simplicity of God. But Athanasius's point and his intuition, which was worked out by the later Christian tradition, was that whatever simplicity means, of God, it has to entail God's, uh, the, the freedom of God to be in union with the not God. So that does not destroy God's simplicity, but if anything, is what simplicity is. So uh, this point by Athanasius is very important because, again, he's basically saying that um, 
what salvation is, is this, this union, right? This union with, with the full divinity. And if that is the case, then the humans, not just simply the, not just simply Jesus Christ, but all humans and creation as a whole has this capacity to have this union uh, with the divine. So that's the grounding, uh, that's the sort of framework. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, maybe some of the questions within this particular forum is the biblical basis. Um, are we looking for particular passages? Um, are we looking for definitive statements of some sort? Um, in many ways, this discussion about the theosis is very similar to the discussion about the Trinity. I mean, um, is that really what we're looking for or are we really seeing a, a tradition, a, a real theological tradition of thinking in the early church about what it means to be the Messiah, the bringer of salvation? And I would say that theosis and even Trinity, which is related to theosis, and I've written about this, how the two are related to each other. Because in the end, theosis comes down to the full affirmation of the divinity of Christ, which is also the grounding for the Trinity the two go hand in hand, sort of Trinitarian theology and theological anthropology. Um, I, you know, I don't think those can be located to any particular passages, but without a doubt, I think reflect um, the biblical witness of God's, uh, you know, God's interaction and relationship to, um, to, to his people. So that's the first point. The second point is what does it look like and here, uh, immediately, I want to say that um, uh, notions of deification or theosis bring up ideas of, you know, superheroes or uh, Zeus or Thor, you know, the, um, so, I mean, maybe that's what Harnack was thinking about when he wrote what he did, um, but that's really not what theosis is meant to convey. Um, it's not meant to be super God, superhuman. Um, and even sometimes the Orthodox, I think, are, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I may say their own worst enemy sometimes in the sense of not really uh, conveying, um, you know, uh, not really articulating what it, what it really looks like. Or when they do convey it, they often convey it in terms of these saints that seem to have superhuman powers, that seem to uh, almost, um, uh, in these saints which seem to have a kind of um, power beyond our natural capacities, which makes it seem as if somehow theosis is something which negates our natural capacities, or our natural capacities get in the way of theosis. Uh, it creates this supernature nature, again, opposition, which I think is false. So some examples are St. Seraphim of uh, Sarov in the forest with the bears, eating with the bears, um, other saints um, seemingly sort of um, uh, kind of, uh, whether it's in the desert or in other places, just seeming to have these kind of superhuman powers. But, um, I don't think that that's a, a, the best image of theosis. I think, um, uh, I do think that the tradition, uh, once Athanasius made his affirmations, continued to think about what, what it means, what it entails. Um, I think one of the best expositors of this is St. Maximus, the confessor in our tradition. I even think in the Western traditions as well, some of the great medieval writers and mystics and others were thinking about this. And my sense is that um, it's, quite, it's actually a quite simple formula um, to become godlike, right? To become perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Um, really means to love as God loves. I mean, if, if, if in fact the, the primary name for God for Christians is love, then to become godlike is to love as God loves in the world. And that includes, of course, our family and friends, but also stranger and enemy because, you know, God loves all unequivocally and irrevocably, no matter what we do. 
um, God's love is always on offer. And it's uh, we who I think uh, sometimes have difficulty receiving that, which uh, to some extent is the cause of our sin. So in the end, we learn that humans are, have the capacity to learn how to love and to love as God loves. And that love is a learning, not simply a kind act. We can, give, we can do kind acts, but still hate the people we're doing the kind act to. But we're trying to transform and notice that somehow we don't feel anger, fear, or hatred in our lives. And to simply love as God loves. And so I think the great ascetical traditions um, are really trying to make sense of that. How is it that we can do certain things in a way that somehow we make ourselves more available to the love that God is always offering us, especially in Jesus Christ? So this is not a works righteousness. It has nothing to do with doing things so we can score points with God. It has nothing to do with doing things so we can earn something. Uh, it has something to do with uh, practices that perhaps contribute to our transformation. I like to analogize them to uh, artistic practices. So to become a dancer, for example, you have to engage in certain practices in order to be, eat, become a dancer that can perform on stage in a certain way. And in many ways, your whole body and soul and being is, is uh, to be a dancer. Um, you're not necessarily you know, doing the things so that you can score points with people, but to ultimately transform your being. And I think that the Christian life is the same way. And we have to transform our being in such a way that we become more loving. And if we become more loving, then ultimately we become more godlike. Um, it's really quite that really that simple. Um, and the tradition is a thinking of practices about how maybe we can do that. Uh, it's a tradition of wisdom, um, not a one size fits all. It requires discernment. Sometimes the tradition is a little bit too extreme. So for example, it talks about saints who never slept much at night and so on and so forth. And uh, I don't really know if that's really good um, uh, path towards theosis because now of course with science, we know that uh, in fact, that sleep is important for our functioning uh, and lack of sleep actually can lead to uh, manic episodes. So, uh, but I do think overall, the tradition is a tradition of wisdom that tries to think about the kinds of things we can do to transform ourselves uh, into more loving beings in the world, which is to become godlike, which is to, because if we love, we love um, because somehow we are connected to the source of love, which is God. And, and so, and that love is really no different than the love that God shows to the world. And that's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult because of many factors. So um, that, I do think well, one final point, um, the th some of the research I've been doing lately has been kind of thinking about, so it's very easy to talk about theosis. And again, the way we portray it about the saint sort of eating with the bears in the forest and the lions and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, I do think that there are serious questions we need to ask ourselves, like what does this kind of way of seeing salvation mean for people uh, who perhaps are suffering various kinds of disabilities, uh, such as Down syndrome. What does it mean for people who are really suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder? I mean, does this concept really help make sense of that or um, Christian way of life? Um, what are we really asking of people in those particular kinds of situations? Um, um, I think uh, it can be, it can also help us think differently about, um, you know, very controversial issues uh, such as, you know, the meaning of sex or gender or identity or uh, sexuality or all those things as well. So I think it has a untapped potential for ways of thinking about the Christian life and especially in terms of certain kinds of um, social issues that, uh, not simply social issues, but also uh, what I might call limit situations for the human being. In other words, those especially those, or maybe the, uh, there's a Roman Catholic theologian named Evan Skilobex who talks about negative contrast experiences. Um, what is theosis? Does it really make sense? 
when we think about these negative contrast experiences. So um, I think these are questions that um, I actually think that this notion of thesis can be quite um, powerful uh, for those uh, particular kinds of experiences, those ways of being, for making sense of people who are going through dis disabling uh, kinds of um, conditions or diseases. Um, and uh, in ways that I think, um, quite honestly, either, if I may, either works righteousness or justification by faith simply can't respond to uh, in ways that uh, I, think, I, I think that those two poles somehow miss the point, um, quite honestly, of the fact that the goal of, of the Christian life is, um, is a kind of transformation but a transformation that doesn't necessarily result from, um, um, doesn't necessarily result or spring forth from a singular event, but ultimately itself is a kind of struggle, a struggle, no question, no question about it, rooted in faith, no question uh, rooted in the uh, work, the salvific work that Christ has done for us, both in the cross and the resurrection, so no question about that making us right with God. But um, it's a kind of work that we do uh, that doesn't, again, that shouldn't be interpreted as counting for our salvation in the sense of, uh, again, scoring points or you know, uh, trying to get on the list for heaven or something like that. But experiencing God's presence now more and more and more. And perhaps you know the, the perhaps that's what's meant by the language of sanctification. Um, it's a kind of holiness that is possible, but in the end, is um, really about uh, trying to become uh, more loving beings in the world as God loves in the world. Uh, that is the virtue of virtues, uh, the the uh, mortar for which is humility. Um, so. I'll stop there. Uh, the two, again, points I think are that grounding point of the incarnation, those theosis is related to that, and of course related to the Trinity, since the Trinity, of course, is related into the incarnation, and, and that in the sense of what it means to, for Christ to be the Messiah, the bearer of salvation, and then ultimately, if that's the, the grounding point, then ultimately what it looks like is to become more loving beings in the world and to engage in the practices and even in everyday life, not just in the monastery, in everyday life, where somehow we can, we can walk in the world uh, with more confidence, with more love, with more patience, with more, with less fear, with less anger, with less hatred. Um, and it's an ongoing, always an ongoing. Uh, well, people like to say struggle, but perhaps a better word is opportunity. So. So I'll stop here because uh, we have 30 minutes for discussion. Um, I do have to leave it right at 11, right at 11 my time because I teach, but uh, I'll stop there and maybe we can open it up for questions. Yes, thank you so very much, uh, Arisotelli. Uh, let me uh, ask, just give you some guidance as to how we're gonna do that. Uh, there are two ways. One, uh, you can use the Q&A button and write your mm -hmm. question. That is helpful, it saves us time. So you can start writing questions and we'll see them and respond. The other is to raise hand and I will allow you to, to talk so we can listen to you. Uh, as you are thinking, so these are the two ways, but as you are thinking, let me uh, ask a couple of questions just to start uh, rolling the right. process. Uh, uh, you talked about uh, misrepresentations of theosis and you used the example of Harnack. Uh, would you see that perhaps even in the Orthodox uh, uh, the theology, there, there are some uh, you yeah. know, misrepresentations? You, you have mentioned that, but uh, if you can, yeah. I mean, because what you said, most of us with the minor, uh, you know, uh, changes, most Protestants can really relate very well, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. so if you if you wanna respond, yeah, to no, that. I, no, I, I think that uh, the Orthodox have um, 
uh, overemphasize uh, this idea that somehow theosis is almost to be above nature and to almost go to free oneself from it, to sort of almost have these kind of superhuman powers, uh, like a superhero of some sorts. And that's, and then sometimes they'll emphasize, of course, the miracles uh, that are performed, um, perhaps the relics and other things, but which, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a person who believes in miracles, but it does give the impression that it's, it's this um, thing that we have to conquer nature. Nature is bad and uh, material reality is bad. And somehow um, theosis is this thing which conquers nature. And, um, I don't think that's the best way to see it. I mean, I really think that we, we need a much more worldly understanding of theosis, right? A, an idea that somehow um, that we kind of simply notice that our capacity in day-to-day -day interactions, um, that I call it the, uh, the uh, architecture of our soul, somehow the, 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 saint, the, the great um, patristic writers talk about the soul in various parts. And theosis for them is really when the, the rational or cognitive um, and the various effective parts of the soul, um, the part that regulates anger and, or thimos and epithymia or desire, when these things somehow are in sync with each other. Um, and uh, that, that can happen in, very mon in more mundane kinds of ways, right? Like when we notice that perhaps within a, even our own family, we notice ourselves beginning, for example, quite angry at various kinds of things. And that kind of anger uh, is affecting our relationship with our family members. So, or if we, we um, are, are having, uh, uh, something is going wrong at our work and we bring that anger, uh, that, that frustration back into our home and it's affecting our relationships. Um, I, I really think that theosis has something to do with those very, uh, on the ground, particular kinds of relationships. It also has to do with our capacity to really, um, you know, relate to people who are strangers, right? I mean, like, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, Christians talk about um, wanting to help others and to be in service to others, but we notice sometimes that we're either too busy or we have a resistance to that. We sometimes make excuses. And I think our capacity to love has something to do with noticing that um, we uh, have a greater desire to be in service with others, right? To get beyond those excuses that focus on the self. Uh, we're always worrying about, um, um, you know, perhaps how we're seen, how we're, you know, how we're doing, how we're, people are measuring us. And then in an enemy as well, like, I mean, we, we you know, enemy, what is enemy? I mean. Um, first of all, I mean, I think there's something to do with not seeing anyone as an enemy, um, but especially those who might, you know, be trying to destroy us in some ways. I mean, this doesn't not mean to be what we call, you know, in the United States, a pushover, right? That we simply let people do anything they want to us. But I do think it means um, even when people engage in actions, even against us in ways that um, are very damaging and harmful, that somehow we have the capacity to see, to not reduce them to these particular actions, to see something bigger in their story, to see them as someone more capable uh, than simply these particular kinds of actions. So I, I just think that theosis has to be a little bit more on, seen in a, kind of an on the ground kind of um, transformative possibility for us uh, where we see it affecting um, our everyday relationships um, in ways that are much more positive. And uh, rather than I go away, I get away from everybody, you know, I have theosis with God and now I can do miracles or somehow, you know, eat with the bears or the lions. I just think it's a little too uh, Zeus like. Uh, Sometimes when the, it, it emphasizes a little bit too much the omnipotence of God, mm -hmm. when in fact we should think about the omnipotence in terms of God's love for us. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have questions coming in. Uh, let me just say that uh, 
uh, to do some advertisement because you did already. Uh, uh, you have uh, written several books, but uh, two books that I think that are very relevant to our discussion uh, is uh, Being with God, which it was my first introduction to your work. Uh, which again you see different models of talking about this kind of being with God, uh, Loski and Zizulus. So you compare the two, which I think is very interesting and intriguing. The other is um, the mystical as political, which I think is translated into Greek as well, isn't it? Greek and, and now Russian. All right. So uh, yeah. so you can speak Russian. Yeah, the, uh, and, the, and the Greek and the and the Greek title has a different name. It's uh, Ipolitikitis Theosis. Politikitis Theosis, exactly. So uh, and and I think that uh, uh, again that underlines what you were just were saying that the, theosis theosis is not it has like a real life uh, application and is not. Uh, so I just wanted to comment this book and we have. Um, Thank you. Several questions here. Uh, you can, yeah. can you see them? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I see them. So yeah, let me. Do, let me do you wanna them. do you wanna read them and then respond uh, so that yeah. you can? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can read them um, by Graham Innes. Um, to what extent is theosis God's work in us? <laughs> to what extent do we play a role in our own theosis? Um, if theosis is synergistic, it might be understood by many Orthodox believers as something they have to do to earn or contribute to their own salvation. So yes, it's a good question. So uh, theosis is definitely not earned, right? Again, that brings up sort of the legalistic model where you do something and God says, good job, here you go, here's theosis. And um, so that's not, it doesn't kind of work that way. I like to see it as, you know, um, God's work in us, um, our work, you know, God's work is is never really. Uh, God's work uh, in us is never really uh, has never is never really stopping, right? So there is a sense in which God is always working, right? God is always loving, right? The world, and to some extent, I think our sin, um, it, what the sin does is not so much that God says, "Well, I'm not going to," you know. I'm going to stop working now because you're sinning. I think what the sin does is we create our own roadblocks to seeing that, to experiencing that uh, love. So I think what we do is not so much earn, but we try to do the kind of work which would open us to receiving, right? To be more aware of, to noticing that it was always there in the first place. And so from that point of view, again, theosis is definitely, it's not, it's no way it's possible without God. I mean, God is the one who, it's our union with God, but that union with God would not be possible if God did not offer God's self. I just think God is always offering God's self to us in Christ. And, uh, but what we do is, that we, I think we, we do the kind of work that would just strip away the roadblocks and slowly, um, or even the, maybe the wall, and maybe the metaphor of the wall, and the kind of work we do sort of chisels away various uh, holes for God to break through. And, and that's why theosis is gradual, because it's not like all of a sudden we, you know, we notice, oh, I'm theotic, but we might notice uh, gradual changes in our temperament, in our relational capacity, in our relationship with God. And I think that that no, and it's okay to 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 say that honestly, right? I mean, I don't think it's. And when we notice those gradual changes, uh, I think that um, what we're doing is um, uh, affirming that we have somehow created, you know, crevices or holes for God to break through to us. And the more we pro progress, I think the more we we take down the wall. So that, and that to me is what makes sense of synergy, I think. Um, it's a difficult concept, um, but I don't, I, I don't understand it in terms of, you know, humans accomplish this, God does that. I mean, that, that brings to mind some medieval notions of acquired and infused virtues and things like that, which I don't, the, the Orthodox never really use that language of acquired and infused virtues. Like what, what can we accomplish? You know, what has God accomplished? Um, I just think that, um, 
you know, it's it's very, you know, it's very difficult to uh, pinpoint, <laughs> but, but you know, we have to believe that God is always loving us, and that somehow uh, our goal is to kind of do the things which will make ourselves available to that love. And when we make ourselves available to that love. We have done something, but in the end, it's God loving us that transforms us, right? It's our experience of that that transforms us. Uh, Aristotele, uh, uh, sorry to, to interrupt because I we have several questions and I know that your time is limited. And okay, uh, yeah. uh, so let, let's go. To yes, uh, we have some good questions yeah. following as well. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, the, the next one, let me, if, if I may summarize it so that we, you yeah. save some time. Um, uh, since what you said that, you know, theosis does not make us superheroes or whatever. So the question is, uh, would you say it is fair to conceive of it as God's grace restoring humans back to our preformed natural state? No, it would be beyond that because the pre-fallen the pre natural state isn't necessarily the native state of theosis, but it's the state of where our capacities um, are such that uh, perhaps the, the possibility for theosis is, um, is less tainted by sin, I would say. But even in the Genesis account, the fallen state really is a fantastic account. I mean, it's, uh, it really is a, uh, an account of our, uh, our, our betrayal of our relationship Right, a betrayal of our relationship. Our communion with God is there. I mean, God is there. God is looking for us in the garden, and it's a fantastic, so wonderful. Uh, uh, and and so it it's a communion with God, and then we betray God, and not only do we betray God, but we then blame others. Right, so the other becomes the person we want to blame in order that we think. So, 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 so we somehow can maintain this communion with God, right? So immediately in the Genesis story, you have love of God and love of neighbor immediately already there. And, and so the sin just continues to, to kind of uh, uh, ripple. It kind of continues to expand and we get thrown out of paradise and the gates are closed, but it's, it's not that the gates can never open again. It's just simply that uh, somehow we have to work for it now. And, uh, and we have to labor for it. And I think that's what ascetical struggle is. I mean, it's not earning, but it's again, kind of making ourselves available to that communion with God. So, but it's, it's beyond, I think it's more than the pre-fallen nature. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, uh, again, shows how um, uh, complex and interrelated is theology because uh, a question is about the dynamic of creation uh, I mean, most Protestants, they see with Augustine that, you know, we have a state that we fall over, but in most uh, Orthodox theologians is already is the potential from the beginning. So it's, uh, it's to become something. Uh, but uh, we have two, the next two questions, in a way they are linked together. Um, uh, is it, so is that it, it, what you are talking about then is what we as Protestants talk about as we talk about sanctification and uh, so the other yeah. question is is theology what they working out work out your salvation that in we read in Philippians 2 yeah. 12 uh, uh, it, well yeah it depends on what we mean by salvation because if I understand sanctification yes thank you if, if I understand sanctification it it it's different from justification in the sense that whatever is happening in sanctification um, isn't really about your salvation. And this is where I would, um, uh, I, so I think I, the answer is yes and no, right? In the sense that um, I would say that, um, again, this idea of salvation, like, you know, you are a savior and made right with God and somehow you were secured a place after you die, right? I, I would say that um, our salvation uh, has to do with progressive union with God, right? And I do think that as the, as the Lutheran theologians in Finland have shown that, and, and, and as this book that you mentioned before we put on the camera by Khaled Anatolios, right? That justification has something to do with, with, with uniting us with God, right? With uniting us in Christ, because you can't be justified unless you're united to Christ. Right. unless Christ is imputed or however, whatever language is being used, right? So there is a union there. 
I just wouldn't separate the two in the sense that um, somehow sanctification is something we work out, but it's not really part of our salvation. I, I think that, I mean, if in fact, uh, I just think uh, with Theosis, the, the, the emphasis really is on what's possible now. I guess that's maybe the thing, right? And if in fact, what's possible now is a kind of progressive union with God, I don't, I don't see how that can be separate from what we mean by salvation, right? Um, and then, of course, God will judge, but that that has to, that the word salvation has to somehow be linked to it. So I think that's that's the subtle difference. I think that we have to kind of maybe discuss in dialogue. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, in the same vein, let me now go to another question. Uh, I mean, you touched on both, you know, uh, uh, on both questions that they follow, but you may elaborate more. So, cis theosis, in your view, appears to be almost equivalent to sanctification. What is the benefit from adapting and using and maintaining the term, considering the misunderstanding that it generates when it has not scriptural precedent? Why not use less controversial language that is less misunderstood? Why not make it more easy, yeah. easily for Protestants, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, <laughs> you know, to, to talk about it? Uh, yeah. About, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. Well, that's a complicated, uh, that's a complicated uh, um, um, question uh, within the Protestant, the, the Protestantism is a tradition within Christianity and within that tradition, I mean, it emerged at a certain point in history when there were debates about justification and works righteousness and so on and so forth. And as a result, this word sanctification somehow uh, became very important to the Protestant tradition. Um, Theosis emerged within the fourth century. Um, I think Gregory, I mean, it could have been Irenaeus or even Gregory Theologian who first really coined the noun Theosis, right? And um, I don't know enough about patristic theology at that period to know how the words um, just sanctification were being used, I'd have to ask. But I would just simply say that um, the word emerged within the patristic tradition uh, without these later debates in mind, right? So, I mean, they both have particular histories to them. And I think the work of dialogue is to become aware of those histories and to see that the words really are not very far apart. I, I, the words really are not, I, I actually think that they both mean the same thing. I mean, uh, sanctification is a little bit unclear about what holiness is, but same with theosis. Like, like I said, theosis, the misunderstanding is to see it as superhuman. Sanctification, holiness could be, uh, uh, any one attribute can be defined, but and we have to kind of agree that what, what, the, what, what the real, uh, virtue of virtues for both really is love, to be loved more loving. Um, I think, again, the real point of, uh, so that's one point of dialogue. Uh, but the other real point of dialogue, I think, is, again, this word salvation, right? And again, the Protestant hesitancy to link salvation to sanctification. Um, but again, I, if sanctification has something to do with having more God in you, I don't, know how that can be delinked from salvation so. yeah I, I i i think it's really fascinating i wish we had more time to clarify things because uh, i think that many orthodox misunderstand the way we talk about justification and uh, yeah. and that that also brings us to this other question which already you touched on, but I think it's very, and actually I was thinking about this question because you based uh, uh, the doctrine of theosis on the incarnation and okay. you're totally right. So what if we change the game, the rules of the game and we said, let's start with the cross. Okay, I mean, yeah. how do we understand? So if, if we make uh, theosis the all encompassing notion uh, based on yeah. the incarnation, uh, and, 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 and so here is the question, in, in your perspective, what is the role of Christ's work on the cross for theosis? Of course, you mentioned Khaled Anatolius, and he has written a whole book trying to uh, bring some kind of a remedy to all this issue that right. Protestants will feel that, okay, what is the cross? I mean, you read 
sometimes whole books, dogmatic books, and they talk yeah. about everything, and there is not even a mention of the cross and you know and what exactly is happening there and why it was necessary. So I elaborated you know, on the no, question. You know, it's a good that may be the, the last uh, yeah, question. Yeah, Perhaps no, we have time for one more. No, no, it's a good, no, it's a good question. Yeah. I think I so did look. I mean, again, we have to see uh, historically too that I, I, um, I say incarnation, but if you read Athanasius too, it has to do with the resurrection, right? And the fact that it's not simply that Jesus is the incarnate one, but Jesus is the, the resurrected one, right? So the resurrection and the ascension themselves are witnesses to this transformation that's possible for creative reality. But I agree with you, it does raise questions about the cross. It's not simply cut on Atolius, but the patristic Orthodox theologian John Baer, yes, in his writing, yes. has been very much, and he might be someone good to bring next. I mean, maybe a follow up. If you, if you, can, if you someone, can connect us, if you can make the connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He's someone I think that um, tries to, he tries to talk really about the passion of Christ. Now, that could create misunderstandings and thinking that it's simply just the incarnate, I'm sorry, just the cross, but by the passion, he means that what is, what Jesus, when, when Jesus reveals, you know, who God is, right, he means the incarnation, cross, and resurrection. And so there's no question that the cross itself um, is a revelation of, uh, of who God is, right? And, and in that sense, it can't be, it can't be uh, delinked. It can't be sort of an add-on to our thinking about theosis. And I think that the role of the cross, uh, to some sense, points to the, the irony of theosis, right? The irony of theosis that to some extent in, you know, that the, that, that, the love of God, I mean, to love as God loves does entail a kind of strength through weakness, right? A kind of a strength through vulnerability. And um, it does indicate uh, a kenosis. Uh, that's a kind of thing essential to theosis as well. Um, I think it, it does It does point to, um, it does point to, um, notions of, of sacrifice and penance um, in the sense that um, um, I, I, so again I, I think that you know the, here I want to be a little bit careful but there there are you know there 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 is a sense it, there is a sense in which that our sin over and against God um, is such that, um, it, it, our sin already against God is such that um, even as we know that we can, God has opened up a path for us to become more loving, right? Um, there is a sense in which um, there is, there's really nothing we can do to uh, counterbalance, for example, um, uh, to um, to counterbalance sort of the the kind of um, break in relationship that our sin causes uh, uh, in in our relationship to God. Um, so I do think that it, it points to the the kind of a, the way of being in the world, the kind of stands, the kind of practice, but the point of really the kinds of practices that we engage in. Uh, in order to somehow open ourselves more to, um, you know, God's, the, the, the love that God has always, that eternally offers and irrevocably and unequivocally offers for us. Um, so as we do these practices, it's not so much, we can never really say to ourselves, as I do this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ultimately doing what God requires, you know, to become right with God, but ultimately there's always a sense in which, um, as we do this, uh, it's not about counterbalancing anything, but ultimately to try to make ourselves available. And, and usually those practices have, in many ways, uh, have everything to do with our own progressive, growing capacity to sacrifice, to be vulnerable, to, uh, to, um, to, to allow uh, ourselves to be weak, um, and to, uh, in many ways, move through uh, 
through a, often often move through a kind of suffering uh, in order to ultimately experience the resurrection and 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 the glory and which really is, is really to experience God's love for us. Thank you. Uh, I am tempted to uh, respond and uh, raise more points, but uh, I think we will stop here. We would like to respect your time. Yeah. Uh, I know there was. No, no, well, I'm, 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 I'm happy to. I'm happy to come. I'm happy to come back, and we can continue because yes. uh, we did just sort of scratch the surface. Yes, but yes. We just yes. The surface, but uh, I do think exactly. I do think, uh, I do think John Bear would be a nice would be a good person. Yes. To, oh yeah, to most uh, Protestants, you know, we I mean, like your work and his work in many ways, we can. It, it, it's a language that we speak, and it's a it's a you know it's a way that we can communicate, frankly. And we do want. Yeah. Uh, I would like to really thank you for. Uh, and yeah, my for one thing, it's, it's important to, uh, in a calm uh, context, to be able to communicate and really listen to each other uh, mm -hmm. and uh, understand better each other and the issues. And yeah. I think that that was a, a great contribution. And we'd thank like to, to, to thank you for that. And we pray that God may continue to use you in... Uh, all these many different ways. So, thank you so very much, all of you, and you. God bless you. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good day.